Kalofa. Good morning. I call today's subcommittee on health and technology hearing to order. I'd like to thank everyone for joining us today. As October is National Women's Small Business Month, today our subcommittee will highlight the outstanding impact women entrepreneurs have made on the United States economy and the remarkable growth women-owned small businesses have generated over the last decade. It is estimated that in 2016, there were 11.3 million women-owned businesses that employed nearly 9 million people and generated over $1.6 trillion. Between 2007 and 2016, women-owned businesses increased by approximately 45%. This means that women-owned businesses grew roughly five times faster than the national average. Despite this remarkable increase, we continue to see a significant difference in the number of women and men-owned businesses in the United States. Currently, women-owned businesses only represent roughly 30% of all businesses. Today, we ask, what factors are contributing to this gap? While women entrepreneurs face many challenges, one major issue women owners face is access to adequate financing opportunities. Men typically, typically launch their businesses with twice the capital women do, and less than 10% of all venture funds are granted to women-led businesses. The matter of access to capital is of particular concern to me, as it is a persistent issue among my constituents in American Samoa. Numerous organizations, nonprofits, and companies are working to address the capital challenge women entrepreneurs face through advocacy, education, and outreach. The Small Business Administration's Women Business Centers and the SCORE are excellent examples of these types of programs. Despite the wonderful work of these organizations, women entrepreneurs still face significant challenges when starting, growing, and scaling their businesses. Today, we will hear from an outstanding panel of witnesses who will shed light on the challenges women entrepreneurs face, the resources currently available, and the areas where existing resources could be expanded to benefit women's businesses. The personal experiences of many of our panelists are stories of remarkable perseverance and strength that have resulted in success. I look forward to learning from each of you. I now yield to Ranking Member Lawson for his opening statement. Thank you, Madam Chair, and good morning. Uh, I am very happy and glad that we've taken the time today uh, about the very important topic concerning the National Women's Small Business Month. Fostering women entrepreneurs' uh, success and is very critical to the prosperity of the United States. Women entrepreneurs play a significant role in the U.S. economy. As our chairman said earlier, uh, they own about 9 million firms that generate either 1.5 or 1.6 uh, trillion in revenue uh, uh, which employ over eight or nine uh, million workers. Despite these uh, impressive numbers, women-owned business still face those barriers, as we discussed earlier, is access to capital. In other hearings, we've heard about access to capital, how important it is to uh, jumpstart these businesses. Just like many other businesses, this uh, committee have heard access to capital as a main topic, challenge, challenge for women. One, in, one uh, as we talked about, on the average, men start their business with twice as much resources, so I won't try to rehash that. And one of the reasons why I know is because I've been in business for 36 years, and I remember going to the financial institution. Women also uh, uh, one-third uh, as likely to access financing through uh, venture capital uh, angel investment. In fact, only 10% of all global venture uh, dollars uh, between two two, two, 2010 and 2015 went to startup with at least one woman founder. We must do better, uh, and that's one of the reasons why we have this hearing. Uh, not only must women work about running business, many 
are more likely to take on caretaker responsibilities for both children and relatives, uh, creating an additional obstacle to entrepreneurship rather than ignoring the need for individuals. We should embrace them and recognize how uh, they sacrifice uh, to contribute to our economy. Congress needs to consider how simple policies, policy changes like paid family leave and affordable care, child care, uh, is so critical to creating jobs and spurring the economy. Women business owners offer a valuable contribution to our co economy, but they need help. Today's hearing offers the opportunity to discuss uh, how Congress can uh, help our nation women entrepreneurship uh, prosper. I look forward to hearing from our witness. We have an outstanding group before us today. I want to thank the witnesses uh, for being here and taking this most important role that is going to help many people in America. Thank you very much, and I yield back to our chairman. Thank you. I'd like to take a moment to um, explain the timing lights for you. You will each have five minutes to deliver your testimony. The light will start out as green. When you have one minute remaining, the light will turn yellow. Finally, at the end of your five minutes, it will turn red. And I ask that you please try to adhere to that time limit. Our first witness is Ms. Janice Green. Ms. Green is the president and CEO of JanCare Private Health Services, Inc., a private home health care provider in Fishkill, New York. After years of experiences as a registered nurse, Ms. Green decided to translate the knowledge and skills she had acquired into starting and running her own successful home care agency. Thank you, Ms. Green, for being here today. Our next witness is Ms. Antonella Pianalto. Ms. Pianalto serves as the president and CEO of the Association of Women's Business Centers, working to provide leadership and support to a network of over 100 women's business centers nationwide. Prior to her time with AWBC, Ms. Pianalto has served as Vice President of Government Affairs for American Express and as a senior advisor to the U.S. Ambassador to the United Kingdom, as a deputy assistant to the President for Presidential Personnel, and as an associate administrator for management and administration for the Small Business Administration. Thank you for being here, Ms. Pianalto. I now yield to our ranking member for the introduction of the next witness. Uh, thank you. It is my pleasure to introduce Ms. Hester Clark, the president and founder of Hester Group uh, headquarters in Jacksonville, Florida, heart of my district. <laughs> uh, Ms. Hester Group is uh, a women-owned small business that provides professional service to federal agencies. In 2011, Ms. Clark was recognized by American Express Open as the 2011 Women Government Contract of the Year, and the Hester Group have been recognized as one of the top 50 women-owned businesses in Jacksonville, Florida. Welcome, Ms. Clark, and thank you for testifying today. Our last witness, our last witness is Ms. Jeanette King. Ms. King is held up in traffic but should be joining us momentarily. Ms. King is the president and CEO of Strategic Resolution Experts, Inc., a management consulting and IT governance firm located in Martinsburg, West Virginia. Ms. King has been recognized numerous times for her success as a small business owner, including being named the Small Business Administration's 2015 Small Business Person of the Year for the state of West Virginia. With that, Ms. Green, you are now recognized for five minutes. You may begin. Good morning. Thank you, Chairman Wagman, Ranking Member Lawson, and distinguished member of the committee for the opportunity to share this testimony with you. My name is Janice Green, and I am a registered nurse with more than 10 years of experience in medical and surgical care and a CEO at JanCare Private Health Service. As a nurse, I had the opportunity to take care of a female patient with stage four cancer. After her death, her husband, a lawyer, was impressed by my caring approach and insist that I started my own nursing care agency. 
I took his advice, and in 2014, I formed JanCare Private Health Care Services. JanCare is on the cutting edge as a nursing care agency. Our vision is to provide outstanding care with compassion and dignity to surgical patients and seniors in the privacy of their own home. My role as a clinical nurse care coordinator is to oversee the care of individual who needs medical or non-medical care through an hands-on approach by implementing a strategic care plan specially tailored to each client's specific need. JanCare works with family, attorneys, geriatric care managers, doctors, and therapists to provide care and outcomes that improve patient quality of life at home. JanCare currently has approximately 28 full-time, six part-time employee, and one intern. We have a client base of 18. We service Dutchess County, Westchester County, Putnam County, and Manhattan. JanCare also believe in giving back to the community and provide free health service to community-based events such as blood pressure screening, diabetes finger stick, and health awareness. One of the biggest challenges for female entrepreneurs is accessing funding. 58% of female entrepreneurs start their business with their own fund. Other studies show that companies with access to capital have grown at the rate of three times that of those who lack equity. Women experience a greater financial gap than their male counterparts. In the process of starting JanCare, I was part of the 58%. I was unable to get a loan from my bank, even though I had a 10-year relationship with them. I was fortunate to have a 401k, which I borrowed $25,000 from at an interest rate of 6%. While completing my MBA, I realized that the business plan for JanCare that I worked on was not feasible. In my research to find an organization to assist me, I found Women Enterprise Development Center, WETC, the WBC in White Plains. I enrolled in WETC 60 Hours Entrepreneurial Training Program to complete an effective business plan. During this course, I realized that so many of my female entrepreneur classmates had great ideas, yet lacked the funding, turn, funding to turn those ideas into reality. While the WEDC course provides the appropriate tools to start without proper fund, it's next to impossible for these businesses to grow. The JanCare business plan that Wednesday helped me to create was more feasible and attainable than my previous plan. As a female entrepreneur, we have made some progress over the past few decades, but we still have a long way to go and we must continue on this journey. Mentorship is important to success of entrepreneur. Female entrepreneurs need guidance through the process of starting and growing their business. Someone who has the experience and the knowledge to show you how to reach your goal is a valuable resource. Anyone can open a business, but having the right tool is necessary for, for success. Running a business day to day can be challenging. Having a mentor to prevent you from making certain mistakes in the process is priceless. The Wednesday community has allowed me to develop strong personal business relationship with my fellow Wednesday graduate as well as with staff. This was an asset for me as it helped my, my self-confidence to grow while allowing me to be part of an organization that fostered network and mentoring. Wednesday support has helped John Care to grow tremendously. Having an individual or group to exchange your idea without discrimination or judgment is a true asset. In closing, I appreciate the opportunity to share my story with this committee, and I strongly urge Congress to increase funding for organizations like WETC, WBC, which help fund and mentor female entrepreneurs just like me. By opening the door to greater access to funding and mentorship for female business owners, we will unlock greater economical potential. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony, Ms. Green. Ms. Pianalto, you're now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman Radawagon, Ranking Member Lawson, and distinguished members of the subcommittee for the opportunity to share this testimony. My name is Antonella Pianalto, and I serve as the President and CEO of the Association of Women's Business Centers. We support women's business centers by providing training, programming, and advocacy to improve their services to women entrepreneurs. In FY16, our centers serve more than 145,000 clients, 
leading to more than 17,000 new businesses and nearly 25,000 new jobs. We assisted with nearly $429 million in capital infusion and helped to secure nearly $40 million in government contracts. As the advocate for this critical program, it's an honor to be here today during National Women's Small Business Month and with this distinguished panel of successful entrepreneurs. Fostering an environment where women can start and grow businesses has been a vital part of America's economic security. Today, that is truer than ever, with more women starting ventures at five times the rate of men. My testimony provides our perspective on women's entrepreneurship, the role of WBCs, and policy recommendation. This statistic captures the impressive scope of women entrepreneurs. If American women business owners were their own country, they would, be, they would have the 10th largest GDP in the world, outperforming entire nations like Canada, Mexico, and even Russia. As already been stated this morning, this footprint is made up of more than 11 million women business owners, a 45% increase since 2007 with $1.6 trillion in revenue. From 07 to 12, women started 1,143 businesses each day, and their revenues grew by double digits at all revenue levels. Notably, eight out of every 10 net new women-owned firms launched since 2007 were started by a woman of color. By any metric, the last decade truly has been an era of women's business expansion. Yet despite this growth, women still face barriers. Women start businesses with roughly half as much capital as men. Despite being 38% of all firms, women receive less than 5% of conventional loan dollars and only 17% of SBA's 7A loans. Women fare no better seeking capital outside of banks. Women receive just 7% of venture capital. Limiting the flow of capital to women-owned businesses is a missed opportunity. First round capital found that their investments in companies which had at least one female founder performed 63% better than their investment in all male teams. Shark Tank's Kevin O'Leary found the same. Of the 32 companies in his private portfolio, all of his returns were coming from companies either owned or run by women. There is vast economic potential in women-owned businesses. Econom economists speculate that if women started businesses with the same amount of capital as men, they could create six million jobs in five years. They also found that if women were fully engaged in their businesses, it would raise GDP by seven percentage points. Sadly, stories of entrepreneurial success tend to be male-dominated, incorrectly framing a narrative that men are better at growing businesses than women. Government leaders can help by highlighting stories as, of successful women entre entrepreneurs like these amazing women. Potential is not limited by capital alone. Women need entrepreneurial training. The Aspen Institute found that when business owners receive technical assistance, su success rates skyrocket. Similarly, as SBA Administrator McMahon notes, more successful women business owners are needed as mentors. Women business centers spend each day unlocking this potential and addressing the challenges women face, as they have for each of the two million women who have walked through our doors. Women view their local WBC as a trusted advisor and partner over the lifetime of their company. Simply put, our role is the glue of the women's entrepreneurial ecosystem, providing a supportive environment that builds competence, confidence, and connections. But our centers need more resources, and too many communities do not have access to this unique service provided by WBCs. There are four policy recommendations that can help women entrepreneurs. Improving access to capital, increasing resources for technical assistance, modernizing the WBC program, and expanding the certification options. We are grateful to Chairman Shabbat, Ranking Member Velasquez, Representative Knight, and Rank Ranking Member Lawson for reauthorization of the program, which was included in the House National Defense Authorization Act. We urge the House to insist on its inclusion in conference. Thanks also to Representative Murphy, who championed an additional $1 million for the program in appropriations for FY18. In closing, I appreciate the opportunity to celebrate the explosive growth of women-owned businesses and the tremendous impact they are having on our nation's economy, and to update this subcommittee on the role WBCs play in ensuring women's entrepreneurial success. We have only begun to tap the potential of this economic powerhouse. Thank you again for this opportunity. Thank you, Ms. Pinalto, for your testimony. Ms. Clark, you are recognized for five minutes. Good morning. 
Thank you for the opportunity to testify before you today to share my experiences and thoughts on fostering women's entrepreneurial success. My name is Hester Clark. I'm the founder and owner of Hester Group, a professional services firm located in Jacksonville, Florida. Hester Group has 28 employee positions and we're located across the United States with an average of 2.5 million in revenue. And as I mentioned, we're located in Jacksonville, Florida. In preparing for this presentation today, I read a July 2017 report by the National Women's Business Council entitled, Necessity as a Driver of Women's Entrepreneurship. The report explores and expands upon the concept of necessity as a driver of women's entrepreneurship in the United States. 20 years ago, I was a necessity entrepreneur. I was a young mother seeking work-life balance so that I could raise my then 12-year-old son and nine-year-old daughter. As a necessity entrepreneur, I needed the resources and support entrepreneurs like me need all over the place, and we're most successful when we have an entrepreneurial ecosystem within our own communities that provides access to human, financial, and professional resources. Thankfully, the Small Business Administration and resource partners such as the Jacksonville Women's Business Center in Jacksonville, Florida are my entrepreneurial ecosystem. I am so humbled to share my journey with you today. For almost 20 years, the SBA and Hester Group have traversed challenges and successes together. There's not one day since starting the Hester Group that I have not been without the support of the SBA and its resource partners. It's as if the SBA and the Women's Business Center said to me, come on, Hester, I'll show you the way. Sometimes I held the hand tightly because I was fearful of taking a big step. And sometimes I held it a bit loosely, knowing that they were there as my partner to provide strength. My entrepreneurial ecosystem in Jacksonville consists of the Jacksonville Women's Business Center, Jacksonville SCORE, Florida Small Business Development Center at the University of North Florida, and the North Florida District Office of the SBA. I've relied on these uh, resources at ev every stage. When I did not know how to establish a financial accounting system, I participated in the fin Financial Matters Workshop. A mentor was assigned to me, helped me understand the financial basics, and most importantly, taught me how to hire an expert to provide financial expertise to the company. When I did not know how to establish my human resources policies and procedures, the Jacksonville Women's Business Center provided six mentors for one year through the Athena Link program. They helped me to understand our corporate infrastructure and maintain compliance. When I needed ongoing support and advice, SCORE Jacksonville provided me with a patient and experienced retired executive. He guided me through the hiring of our vice president. He knew exactly what Hester Group needed uh, to succeed, and our vice president, Ms. Rosa Mixon Phillips, continues with us today and is a vital member of our team. When I needed access to capital, I was able to receive an SBA 7A loan with the support of the North Florida District Office. The, S the 7A loan has been the foundation for our growth and ex expansion. The SBA and its resource partners in North Florida continue to extend a helping hand to Hester Group as we've grown over the years, and I continue to hold on real tight. My journey as a woman entrepreneur is not unusual, not at all. There are over 10 million women entrepreneurs in the United States, and we all share similar paths. Each of us are unsure, at times unknowing, and yet unafraid to become an entrepreneur. And each of us needs support and guidance along the way. I've shared my journey with you today as, as an example of the direct benefits. I recommend that the SBA continue to expand access to capital, expand community outreach in rural and underserved communities, expand funding, provide disaster assistance funding, and enhance online resources. In summary, I encourage this committee to provide the SBA, Women's Business Centers, and other organizations with the funding and support that we need to hold perhaps just one more or one million more hands of women entrepreneurs. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Clark. Ms. King, you're now recognized for five minutes. I have had the honor and privilege of serving my country since I was 19 years old. 
It began with my service in the U.S. Navy and has continued through my work with my small, small business with agencies within the Department of Defense, Department of Homeland Security, Department of Veterans Affairs, and a number of federal civilian agencies. Good morning, I'm Jeanette King, President and CEO of Strategic Resolution Experts, or SRE. I'm both honored and humbled by the invitation to speak to this esteemed body and have the opportunity to not only represent women-owned small businesses, but also service-disabled veteran-owned small businesses, veteran-owned small businesses, 8A small disadvantaged businesses, and hub zone certified small businesses, all small business types of which I am certified. I'd like to speak on the challenges and successes I have experienced since founding SRE in 2007. First, I'll speak about access to capital. Second, I'll speak on the small business programs and how they have positively influenced my business and some of the negatives. Third, I'll speak about being a woman-owned small business who also happens to be a service-disabled veteran. I started SRE in 2007 with $10,000. I was and still am a single mother with no access to any other capital. I have no husband, I have no family with money. So I left a job making over six figures per year to live at or below poverty level for nearly five years. During this time, I cashed in all of my 401ks, deferred all my student loans, and prayed that I could feed my son Cody and keep our house. During this time, my mom and stepdad agreed to allow me to put a second mortgage on their home and property to try to keep me afloat. But by 2009, I'd maxed out the line of credit, which was very small, and I was paying my mortgage with my credit card and my credit card with another credit card and so forth until it got to the point where I was afraid I was not only gonna lose my house, but my parents were gonna be homeless as well. So in 2009, I was offered a job and I was ready to go. Um, a few days before I took the job, they said, hey, we need a 1099 consultant. So I said, will you subcontract to SRE? They agreed. That contract saved my business. In four months, I made enough money to, to live for about six months, and then shortly thereafter, I landed my 8A designation through the Small Business Administration, and then three months later, got two small prime contracts with the IRS. Soon after that, I received a significant prime contract from Defense Threat Reduction Agency through my contacts and relationships I'd been fostering for over five years. Once I received that contract, which was over $3 million, only then could I get a line of credit. I got it through the SBA under the backing of the Patriot Express program, which I think is obsolete now. And the reason why I couldn't get a loan is because despite the SBA's guarantees, small businesses still have to meet the bank's underwriting guidelines, and I did not. So I was a single mother from West Virginia who come from economically disadvantaged background who served in the military and could really only pray for a miracle to find a way to start and keep my business. I don't know the answer to this challenge, but I'd be happy to work with any of you to find the answer. So I'll talk about the small business programs. As I said, I possess every single small business designation that there is, and there are some challenges in the paperwork. The 8A program, my paperwork was over 1,000 pages. It got lost initially, then it got rejected, legal overturned it because I could clearly show social and economic disadvantage despite not being in one of the protected classes. Same with service disabled veteran owned and veteran owned. While getting the designation through VIP and vet biz is much better because it's now two years, it's very time intensive. Same with woman-owned small business. That program um, is okay for me now because I'm 8A, but once I'm out of 8A, these programs altogether probably take about 80 hours, which is not a lot of time, but when you're a small business and, and time is money, um, they can be challenging. Um, <clears throat> the hub zone designation was by far the most challenging, which we can talk about that offline, but I wanna talk more about my successes. Thanks to these various programs and the support and guidance I received from my West Virginia SBA office in Clarksburg, I have a line of credit, I've grown SRE into a multi-million dollar company, and I use the Hub Zone program as it was intended to help disadvantaged individuals in economically depressed areas to become trained and qualified to obtain sustainable jobs. Our Hub Zone program employs 14 people across the country, and they've completed in just last year over 2,000 hours of training, 622 courses, and 97 certifications. Four of those employees now go to college, and their family members, uh, two of them are in the Job Corps training program. Being a woman-owned services able veteran-owned small business is an opportunity to use our nurturing hearts and spirits to serve others, improve our communities, our states, our country, and the world in which we live. I do this by providing jobs across 12 states, and nearly a half a million dollars in charity and a thousand hours of paid volunteer time. 
In closing, I'm thankful for this opportunity. I would like to thank you for your service and the time here. And just to let you know, last week, SRE won a $9 million contract and a $50 billion contract. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. King, for your testimony. I now recognize myself for five minutes of questions. My first question is for our three small business owner panelists. Each of your testimonies references the challenges you faced when starting and growing your businesses. Of those, what was the greatest challenge you experienced or continue to experience as a woman entrepreneur? Ms. King? The greatest challenge I experienced was access to capital. I had to self-finance my business, and again, I started with $10,000 and, and credit cards and um, you know, a, a second mortgage on my parents' property. Um, that is not so much of a problem anymore because I do poor, poor people financing. That's what I call that. I will find a way to make it work, and I have, again, by some small miracle, but I think that is a challenge for every business that starts, starts out without capital. Ms. Green? My greatest challenge would be mentorship. When I started my business, I had that issue, and Betsy came along. And even though today, I still have that issue because as you go to another level, you need higher mentorship. So that's my greatest challenge right now, to have someone to lead me to the next level. Ms. Clark? I think my greatest challenge now is uh, support at the second stage of a business. Um, as I mentioned, I used a lot of the resources early on and as a founder of the business, there are, are a lot of resources there. But as the company has grown, I would love to see the women business centers funded so that they can provide more enhanced programs for more mature companies in the second stage of business. My next question is for Ms. Pinalto. Unfortunately, the WBC previously located in American Samoa closed, limiting the access my constituents have to WBC resources. What is the AWBC doing to work with individual WBCs to increase their ability to remain open long term? So thank you for that question. Um, what we have been working on for the last couple of years, I've, I've been at the helm of the AWBC for three years now, is m more uh, sharing of best practices, sharing of the experiences of some of the larger WBCs and the more experienced WBC directors. There was not a lot of that done uh, prior, so uh, we're actually working on a, a very big project right now where we will develop best practices, we will develop SOPs, templates that all WBCs can um, can use. Some of our smaller ones, and America Samoa was one of those, uh, are, are, it's challenging for them. Uh, as part of their grant obligation, they have to match the grant money that is provided by SBA. In the first couple of years, it's a 50% match, and then after that, it's a 100% match. For the centers that are in communities that don't have large corporations or other sources of funding, it's a challenge. And I don't know all the specifics of, of what happened with the WBC in America Samoa because SBA doesn't share that. But I know raising funds is, is one of those. And, and so we are trying to provide training and um, and support to those centers in helping them raise that funding, but it's a big issue. Thank you, Ms. Pinalto. As a follow-up, what is the AWBC doing to expand the resources available to WBCs through WBCs to clients without access to brick-and-mortar training centers? So, I think the value of the women's business centers is the um, is their work within their communities. So it is a challenge for them to provide the services outside of that community um, that they that perhaps might not have the physical access. I mean, we do hear that frequently. That and and some of our panelists today talk about that. It's that interaction. Um, with the centers, and not only with the staff of the centers, but the interaction with other um, 
women business owners, they create this community and build, the, build this network. So it is challenging for those communities that don't have a center right there. We do have centers, um, I'll use an example of our one in North Dakota. It's one center and, and it covers the entire state and they are on the road constantly going into the communities um, and bringing the resources there. Not all of the centers have that capability. Many of our centers have one to one and a half staff people. It's very difficult for them to cover a large geographical territory with that kind of uh, staffing. Thank you. I have a question for Ms. King. Your testimony discusses your journey to entrepreneurship. What made you decide to pursue creating SRE despite the immense challenges you faced? Thank you. As a single mother, it was very important for me um, to provide my son the opportunity to go to college and not struggle the way I did growing up. And so that was really my inspiration. And quite honestly, failure was not an option. Uh, my son just left for college in August, and I was able to pay for his entire six years of college, and he's going to be a doctor. Thank you. I now yield to Ranking Member Lawson. You're recognized for five minutes. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Uh, this was a problem for me, and I just, uh, because you all are women entrepreneurs, I would like to see how maybe, whether you all was able to handle a lot better than I was. And that uh, centers around the, f the financial burden that is, li that is, uh, that pro that is so con about medical uh, leave. Uh, particularly challenge which make it harder uh, for you to attract, you know, employees uh, because of medical leave. And the reason why I ask this question more is because I had a situation where it just seemed like it just kept coming up, uh, one child birth after the next, you know, with a very talented individual. Uh, do you think that uh, nationally administrated programs uh, could ease the financial burden and allow small businesses to uh, ensure that all work workers have access to paid family and medical uh, leave regardless of uh, employer size? And that is a question for everyone. If I can stop Ms. Green. A deal that sounds great, but for a small company to have um, family medical leave of absence, that's what you're talking about, correct? Right. Uh, for instance, my company has 28 employees, and if someone goes out sick because of family leave of absence, it's very hard to get even coverage for that. So for me, it's very hard to, to say something in regards to that because as a small business, we have to have good staff to care for seniors in the home. So if the government can take that part, alleviate small business on that, the family medical leave absence, that would be great for me as a company itself. I know, and I know you have a lot of experience with this. I, I'm not. I'm going to defer to okay. uh, to the small businesses. <laughs> yeah. Ms. Clark. Uh, yes, personally, I of course support um, a family and having choices and being able to uh, have the flexibility. Um, that's why I started my company, which which was because I needed work life balance. But now as a business owner, funding those types of uh, programs and support for our employees is difficult. So on one hand, I support it. And so what we've done, it is very hard to make up that amount if it's not embedded in your contract. Um, what I would hope to see is that we're allowed to, of course, have those costs included in, particularly in government contracting, so that we can then have those costs covered for our employees. What we've done in the interim is use um, work-life balance, using uh, work from home, using uh, work flexibility, um, telecommuting, those things, anything that I can do. And at times, probably um, when we were much smaller, bring the child to work because that's what I had to do when I was first starting the company. But in terms of the actual uh, making it mandatory, we would need to see the ability to have something offset those costs to our company. Ms. King, and you was talking about your son, so I know. Yes, sir. So as a small business, I'm asking at least my business, to provide 
paid time off under Family Medical Leave Act would potentially bankrupt me. But what I do is I offer short and long-term disability. So if we have um, anyone, women or men, who need to take off six weeks, 12 weeks, 20 weeks, we offer that insurance coverage for them that they can elect, and that's at a group rate, so that they're covered um, under you know, uh, the disability insurance, so that we don't have to pay FMLA out of pocket. So it's an insurance policy. Okay, thank you. Um, may I continue? Yes. Okay, I heard earlier uh, that most of you uh, spoke uh, that the SBA has been very helpful and uh, holding your hand all through the uh, process. And when uh, SBA uh, came before uh, the full committee, uh, they talked about all of the new services and so forth that they provide uh, for uh, uh, small business owners. And particularly, they recognize the fact that women own business are the fastest growing businesses uh, in America. Uh, with, by making that statement, uh, what improvements would you make uh, to us as Congress people as we approach uh, 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 the uh, uh, SBA that can really help women-owned business more? And I guess uh, I'll start again down on with Ms. King, and then we'll move back the other way. I think that's a great question. I think that our legislative bodies are cognizant of the challenges for small businesses, and, and you all passed great legislation and great policies, I think one thing to consider for the SBA is their staffing and their appropriations and their budget. Because they do a great job and they're very dedicated to us, they need more help. I think that is the biggest thing, because they have the heart, you're giving them the tools, you give them the policies and the set-asides, but they do need more help. Okay. Yes, I agree with what Ms. King has said. Um, in addition, uh, continuing to offer uh, many of the resources online, um, I'm real passionate about rural and underserved communities. And when you're running a business, it may be difficult to attend uh, in an activity, although I love the, the flexibility of being able to go out. But making those resources available and then looking at non-traditional methods of communication so that people in the beginning, you're afraid to go in and be among other people and to uh, really admit what you don't know. And so some resources that uh, would allow an, an entrepreneur like myself to really admit in a more private setting how I need the help, because it's very frightening to step out there the first time and say, you know, I need help with this. Online might be a way to do that, because it provides resources and after-hour resources and midnight resources. And so I would encourage funding for after-hour resources through the SBA. I will certainly concur on the uh, increase of resources, uh, especially funding, and I'll uh, obviously uh, bias towards the Women's Business Center program. But I will say we have to do, and SBA certainly can help with this, we have to do a better job of just educating small businesses out there about the resources available. I hear time and time again that people don't know that there are women's business centers uh, even in their own communities, and that's just obviously one of the resources available. So we have to do a better job of getting the word out and making these services more accessible uh, and, and just, again, informing small businesses of what's available to them. I would say um, resource and funding. The WBC in White Plains, that's the center that I belong. I had to pitch quite a few times for them to get extra money because their office was so small and they were trying to get a bigger space. So I think resource and funding for SBA would be a great opportunity for them. Thank you. What's that on your back, Madam Chair? Ms. Green? Uh, Access to adequate financing has been a key topic in today's hearing. You mentioned that your business is self-funded. Had you had access to alternative funding, how do you anticipate your business experience would have changed? If I had access to uh, alternate funding, my business would have grown much more. I would have marketing, uh, someone to market my business. I would have all the right tools that a business run. And when I started my business, um, the $25,000 didn't go too far. 
So I actually had extra help, but not from the banks or any other funding. I grew from being part of White Sea 2015 to 2016, I grew to $2 million. I figure if I had access, I would have been a $10 million by now. So I think if we have, because the plan that I have can allow me, but don't have the funding is a problem for us. This question is for Ms. Penalto. Your testimony cites a study which says that if women started businesses with the same capital as men, they could create six million jobs in five years. What do you see as the reason or reasons that women are not currently able to gain access to that same level of funding that men do? I wish I knew the, exa all of the exact answer, um, but I'll cite a, a few things that I, I think contribute to it. Um, I think one of the issues is I think it's over 40% of women-owned businesses are in professional and, um, and personal service businesses. And I hear stories all the time of women, just like the women at this table, it's much harder to get funding, traditional funding, especially through banks, if you're a ser in the service industry because you don't have the collateral, you don't have the assets that a, uh, another type of business might have. So I think because more women are in that type of business, that's, uh, that's one of the, the issues. Uh, I think another issue is just the number of women actually asking for uh, capital. Uh, we need to educate and train and help them through the process of applying for either a loan, a, 7, a 7A loan, SBA loan, or a traditional loan. Um, some of those studies that I cited in terms of even the venture capital um, statistics, again, it's the number of women that are going and asking for that venture capital. We need to increase those numbers. So I think th that will help. I, I will also say that we don't have great statistics, especially from bank lending, on lending to women and minorities, because banks aren't required to keep those statistics and share them. So we don't really know in some instances if a woman has gone to a bank what the reason was that she didn't uh, get, didn't get that loan. So um, I know the CFPB is supposed to be uh, f writing rules that were included, uh, provision included in the Dodd-Frank Act for banks to collect that data, and I, uh, it's been how many years now, and that hasn't happened. Until we have better data about what women are going through in that, I'm not sure we're going to know all of the answers. Ms. Clark? Your testimony mentions that you started your business out of necessity as a means of providing a better work-life balance for you and your family. In what ways do you believe that being an entrepreneur of necessity affected your business creation process? That's a very good question. Being an entrepreneur of necessity, um, oftentimes you start with a little bit of knowledge because uh, you know, you're really fueled to do something different and to have what you need, which in my case is work-life balance. A 12 and a nine-year-old are, are busy ages to raise children and I needed to be there and did not have the leave and the flexibility. Um, so that sort of pushed me out there. Had I um, been fueled by another aspect, I probably would have had more preparation, certainly would have had better technology. Um, and would have received um, probably funding earlier because I would have asked for it. Just as you mentioned, I didn't know to ask for it. Uh, so preparing to be an entrepreneur and being an entrepreneur of necessity are very different um, starting points. And I would encourage that even women who are not sure or to be, for women to begin to learn more about perhaps in um, middle or even high and, and high school and college, to just learn that entrepreneurship is um, a, a way that they can increase their family's income. So for me, I think uh, had I been um, not an uh, entrepreneur of necessity, I would have been more prepared to start my company. Thank you. I now yield to Ranking Member Lawson. You are recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Madam Chair. Um, uh, diversity studies show it is harder for minority and women-owned small businesses uh, to not only uh, get the business started but also develop the business network uh, needed to grow uh, in these businesses. Uh, have you found uh, this to be true in your work 
who has small business, Ms. Kane. Unequiv unequivocally, yes. It is very true. Um, when a woman walks in the room, especially in government contracting, we're a, definitely a minority. There's usually 500 men at a conference and two women. And so it's, we have to establish ourselves as you know, real entrepreneurs and people with authority and so forth. Um, and I had a mentor, a male mentor who was a Marine tell me one time, he said, being a woman is your secret weapon. You walk into the room and they have no idea what's in your head until you start talking and then they know. And so I've always used that, but it is difficult because especially, like I said, in government contracting, it's mostly a man's world. Right, and, and as a follow-up, uh, in many cases in small businesses seeking government contract, a lot of the small business owner will hire lobbyists uh, to approach these government agencies. How does that affect you when you're trying to get uh, contracts uh, on, on a federal basis? Uh, we don't work with lobbyists because we don't have the money for them. Um, so I, I, we would have business development folks or I would go and talk to small business representatives. I mean, really it's boots on ground being there and almost stalking them to get business. We don't have lobbyists, so that, that's not even an option for us. Right. Could uh, any of you all, could anyone else comment whether it's been an issue uh, when you're trying to get government contracts when other firms, especially men-owned business, come in with lobbyists and you all don't have the resources to do that? Does it affect you in any way? I can't speak specifically as to whether another company has a lobbyist, but I can uh, speak to uh, watching in an environment where uh, perhaps men own, uh, non-women owned businesses were either large businesses or, um, or smaller uh, businesses owned by males were able to have a larger set of resources because they had pulled together um, and it's something that they've been at the game longer. And so they were pulling together or maybe members of associations that did have lobbyists. Um, what I learned to do was to watch and to go where they were going. And it, having a lobby is not a, even an option for us. We have no funding for that, as, as you mentioned. But I would want to understand greater what impact that does have. You've, I never really thought about it that way, as you mentioned it, but perhaps understanding if that is something that's available, making sure that it's available to everyone. Right, and, and the reason why I ask that question, because I've, I've seen it in state government trying to get state contracts when some firms come in with their resources and stuff and other firms send in a lobbying group sometimes that have a little bit more input and influence uh, on the process when they walk in. It was a, a Indian group that came in uh, when I was in there that was really, uh, came in from Jacksonville, SGS Technology, and they were trying to get the government contract, but they were at a real disadvantage when they got to Tallahassee, and that's the reason why I asked you, uh, because it's more of a government town. But I want to try to get this in the end for my time run out. Uh, we've heard uh, again and again some serious accusations uh, about discrimination in the, in the lending space. Uh, what measures would you suggest to improve women's ability to access uh, uh, capital? And, and that goes to uh, Ms. Green. So I'm gonna talk about someone that I know, a friend of mine who's trying to get venture capitalists, and it's the harder thing, the hardest thing for her to get. She said, pitching before, um, thousands of people, it's very hard to get as a female entrepreneur. For me, it's different because I'm from a private sector. So the only time I feel like I'm not part of the room is when we have 15 guys run a home care agency and I'm the only female there. So when it comes to capital now for me, it's not like before, but my other female counterparts do have that issue going forward. Anyone else want to, I got 10 minutes, 10 seconds. <laughs> okay, Ms. Clark. Um, for funding, the, um, our personal journey was that we went to a small community bank. Uh, I do believe those resources are available and continuing to support community banking in a way that uh, allows them to be able to provide uh, lending. That was 
that was what was helpful to us. Although we banked with a very large bank, we were not able to um, navigate through their maze. But uh, with a community level bank, we were able to go in, uh, share our story. We had years of financing at that point, probably 12 years, I mean, years of records, 12 years of successful, um, of running a successful business. And so um, I think from the getting funding standpoint, making sure that uh, the, the community banks are aware and participating. And then it all goes back to education. Honestly, I didn't know to ask. Um, and when I went in to ask, it was, be, it was out of necessity. I was at the 11th hour, had a new contract, had employees, and needed the funding. And that's not the time that you want to go in and ask for money. So starting earlier and empowering us, and then having other women like myself tell my peers, you can do this. Take your paperwork, go in there, and uh, and ask for the funding. There are programs. The 7A was was our lifeline, and it has made all the difference in the growth of our company. Okay, that, Madam Chair, I yield back. I now yield to Mr. Blaine Lutkemeyer, Vice Chairman. You are recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair, and welcome, ladies. Uh, I want to follow up on uh, the previous questions with regards to funding. Uh, because basically that's, if you don't have funding, you can't get off the ground. And uh, all of you have faced that problem apparently. And I was kind of curious, uh, you know, there are, there are rules against discrimination uh, based on sex. Are you, do you believe that you're discriminated against because you're women versus the men? I know, Ms. Green, you made a statement, you know, you're one, one out of 15 and the, the guys have, get first, <laughs> first crack at everything and you get left out. I mean, it, you feel you're left out because you were a lady, or do you feel that uh, they got, they, they had, you know, and Ms. Clark just made mention of the fact that there's, maybe they needed a, maybe you need a mentor to be able to help you prepare better to be able to be able to, to qualify. I mean, can you explain your, your concern? I do feel like I was left out because I was a female. That is true. Um, in Fishkill that I live, I went to three banks to get a loan for $25,000. One of them was a credit union, and they told me that I didn't have enough fund, even though I had 10000 in the account. They did not want to lend me a loan. So I feel like because, and even when I present my business plan to say, here is a business plan, if I make this money, I'm able to repay back, I was not able to get the loan. So I felt like because I was a female, they didn't take me serious. And then the business that I was going into was nursing care agency. The, the banker says to me, there's like a thousand agency out there. How do you think you're going to manage? Would you have all these big competitors? And I said, well, they had to start small to get big. So if you give me a chance, then I will. So then I realized I couldn't get it. I just had no choice but to go to my 401k to start the business process. So I did feel like as a female, and then they think I didn't have the education. And even though I said I'm in school going for my MBA, it didn't mean anything. So for me, I felt like it was discriminated as a female. Well, I can tell you, your, your story is not different from a lot of, lot of men that try to get in. If, if, if small businesses are tough to start. I mean, I, they're, I mean, regardless of if you're a guy or a gal, I mean, it, it just, you, you, it's the, the criteria that you have to meet to be able to get started is just tough, and I, I, I'm just curious of your concern there. Uh, <clears throat> Ms. King, in your testimony, you talked about uh, having to spend or have to fill out roughly 1,000 pages to be able to qualify as a uh, woman-owned business. Can you talk a little bit about that? Is, is, is that, is, number one, I guess, did, is it really a thousand pages? And, and is your designation really that important uh, to fill it all out? And how, how cumbersome was it and how much did it cost? So I was actually referencing my 8A SDB designation. That was a thousand pages. So essentially there's an application and then you have to provide supporting evidence. And that supporting evidence was 1,001 pages. The first one was 600 and, or 500, and the next one was, sorry, 501. So that was for the 8A. Um, I have a streamlined process with women owned now because I am an 8A, but once that expires, I will have to go through the process of proving I'm a woman, number one. Number two, that I own and run my business and that I'm not a front for a man because that does happen, unfortunately. And then I have to provide all my financials, all my tax records, all my bank records. And, you know, There's a lot of paperwork because they want to make sure, first of all, if you say you're a small business, that you are. And if you try to get the disadvantage designation, you have to prove that you are disadvantaged. So they ask for literally all of your financials, everything you own, and the kitchen sink, literally. 
So that's what I had to do for 8A. What, what was the cost of that? Do you know, know off the top of your head? Well, I paid a lawyer $5,000 to do it the first time, and it got outright denied. And I said, I'm smart enough to figure this out on my own. So myself and one of my employees, we sat down and spent three days and got all this documentation together, and I did it myself. So it cost whatever that three days of time and labor were. Okay. Do you feel is worth that to you? The designations, is it worth that much? They're, they are all worth it, yes, sir. All of the designations are worth it. I think there's a way to streamline. If, if you want to get a designation through VA, SBA, have one portal. Put all your documents in it, and then there's, I mean, we do IT. We can help you build an algorithm that will tell you, you know, they qualify for all of these things. Boom, it's done. The, the, right now, you have to fill out this form to qualify for every single agency you deal with. Every single designation. So there's 8A, okay, there's VOSB, SDVOSB, Hub Zone, Woman Owned, and EDWSB. So there's like, what, what was that, six, seven? Different. More, more than a handful. <laughs> different pieces of paperwork, <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> well, I, you know, this this is a great place to talk about red tape, because that's the only thing we, we know how to do well <laughs> around here is add, add more red tape to everything. Um, <clears throat> but I do appreciate your, your, your comments on my time's expired. Thank you very much. I now yield to Dr. Roger Marshall. You're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, ma'am. And thank you, ladies. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I've lived part of it as a man in a woman's world. It's kind of upside down. You know, kind of get my thoughts together here. I think as I see the inequalities that still exist, I would say number one is that women's pay for the same job in the management levels is not the same. I think that's still a huge problem. I think women's access to the boardroom is still a problem. I, see, I think we make great strides in getting women into medical school and law school and getting uh, access to those things, and now it's time for the, the gap to, to be closed. But one thing, it's hard to... Uh, be prejudiced against women is starting their own business. So I think that's a great place to start here is is uh, starting your own business and being small entrepreneurs. I want to relate one more story. Goodness, 30, 20 years ago, Rotary started letting women into Rotary. We wouldn't have Rotary clubs today without women. They do 90% of the work and follow, have great follow through. And I think the same thing I'll see in small business and then just encourage uh, the small businesswoman to think about those types of service organizations as they give you connection and open up the world. Tell me, and, and maybe each of you take 30 seconds rather than three minutes, I'll let each of you answer the question. What do you wish Congress would do to help empower women to be successful small businesswomen? Ms. Green, do you want to want to start? Those would be the two things that I want to speak about, mentorship and financing. Finance meaning access to capital. Access to cap capital. To business. Um, venture capitalists, whatever it is in regards to funding, that would be great for a female entrepreneur. I do run across a lot of female entrepreneurs who start business and in no time they're out of business because they don't have the fund uh, to, to continue the business itself. And they do have the passion and the idea, but not with the funding, not now, able cash to. Cash flow is always a challenge. It takes one amount of money to start it, but no one counts on the, the cash flow. Ms. Penolto, what about you? What are your thoughts? So I am I am not an entrepreneur. I'm, okay. I'm, you, uh, I'm with the Association of Women's Business Center. So um, my focus is getting more technical assistance to women, and that it not only involves access to capital, but also the mentorship that Miss um, Green has has talked about. But we just need uh, uh, you know, we all these statistics. I mean, there's such potential with women-owned businesses, and we just need to get them all in the the growth mode. And they just need uh, many of them need assistance to right. do that. Miss Clark, I think the most important thing is to continue to ensure that we have a healthy workforce. And the Affordable Care Act does that and also removes uh, any penalties for pre-existing conditions. As a mother of um, a child who has a pre-existing, or an adult now who has a pre-existing condition, I shudder to think what 
his life would be like if he was not able well, to get that covered. Start that over. How did the Affordable Care Act help small business or, or access to workforce? What was that again? How? It ensures a healthy workforce universally across the United States, and so therefore I'm able to hire yeah. individuals who. That's, that's um, really interesting. Um, the Small Business Association got together in February, or March up here, and they said the number one concern they had was the cost of health care. And nothing has done more to drive up the cost of health care than the Affordable Care Act. So uh, you, you may have, you, I, and I don't think it's done anything to improve the health of the country, but to say it's going to increase your workforce, I disagree with you respectfully. So anyway, all right. Yeah, Ms. King? Yes, sir. So Access to capital is important. I think one of the things that Congress could do is to strengthen the guarantee programs through the SBA. Right now, there are certain percentages that they will guarantee. Um, if Congress could say, we will guarantee 100% at different levels. So maybe if they're very small, it's 25,000, and as their revenue goes up, in increase those uh, guarantees. Or maybe as their revenue goes up, the guarantees go down because the company has more cash flow. That would be one of my recommendations. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, I'll yield back, Chairman. I'd like to thank each of the witnesses for being here today, and I'd like to congratulate Ms. King, Ms. Green, Ms. Clark for the outstanding success of each of your businesses. And thank you, Ms. Pinalto, for the important work the AWBC is doing to provide our nation's women entrepreneurs with the resources they need to be successful. It's clear that uh, while impressive growth has been seen in the number of women-owned small businesses over the last decade, there's still a great deal of work to be done. So as we continue to work to address the challenges facing women entrepreneurs, such as access to adequate financing, this committee applauds the success and dedication of both our nation's women business owners and those organizations seeking to help them succeed. Now I ask unanimous consent that members have five legislative days to submit statements and supporting materials for the record. Without objection, so ordered. We are adjourned. Faftai te le lava, soy fua. <laughs>